Beautiful day in South Georgia. You're taking a look at the Glynn County Courthouse in Brunswick. Um, this is the site of what is going to be a huge trial, jury selection taking place. Um, and once they get that jury in place, um, things will start. Court TV cameras inside, gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage. This is the trial involving the murder of Ahmad Arbery. Ahmad Arbery, a young guy uh, from South Georgia down in Brunswick, uh, was out for a run running through a neighborhood he had run through before. Uh, Satilla Shores was followed by three men in two pickup trucks. Uh, they pursued him, and then eventually Travis McMichael, who had a shotgun in his hand, um, shot and killed Arbery. His father, Gregory, was in the back of the pickup truck on the phone uh, with police at the time, while William Roddy Bryant was in the trailing uh, pickup truck with his cell phone recording the whole thing on video. Let's bring in the Court TV legal correspondent Julie Janae is joining us live from Brunswick tonight. What is the latest in jury selection? Vinny, the latest is we have now 47 of the 64 potential jurors that are qualified that we need to get to the 64 that the court would like to have before those peremptory strikes today. It was a long day, not only for the potential jurors and the attorneys and court staff, everyone involved inside of that courthouse, but also I watched as Ahmaud Arbery's mother, Wanda Cooper Jones, walk out of the courthouse today very late. And you could tell it's just a tiring process for many of the people involved. Here's a look at the scorecard for that pool of 20 who were inside of the courtroom today. Actually, it was only 19 that showed up. Four of them said that they knew Ahmad Arbery personally. Three knew his parents, Wanda Cooper Jones and Marcus Arbery. Two said they know the McMichaels. Another two said that they knew Kevin Goff. And there were also seven who answered questions about law enforcement. They raised their hand to say they'd had a good experience with law enforcement. Twelve agreed that people of color are treated differently by the criminal justice system. And four were concerned about their safety or career if they were chosen to serve on this jury. I had the opportunity to be inside of what is typically a more secret individual voir dire process where only a few members of the media are allowed inside. There are tense moments. There are some jovial moments when these uh, potential jurors come in, but it can be very daunting for them to come in and see all of these attorneys around the courtroom just circling them and tossing these questions at them one by one. It is. Yeah, you're kind of putting the spotlights. It's you're, you know, they're trying to pick your part, figure out who you are. Um, there were some uh, allegations today or some issues involving a juror and social media, Brady violation. What's going on down there? This was a point of contention at the middle of the day. There was a break in the afternoon, and when we came back from the break, Kevin Goff, the attorney for William Roddy, put a uh, motion on the record with the judge having to do with social media. So I want to start first with juror number 199 because that's really what tipped all of this off. She's a black woman in her 50s or 60s, appeared to be on the questionnaire about Ahmaud Arbery. She said they hunted him down and killed him like an animal. But she did say that she could be a fair and impartial juror in this case. She said nothing about the posts that she's seen on social media would keep her from being fair. Then Jason Sheffield, the attorney for Travis McMichael, he raised the issue of some postings that he said were on social media. She initially said she didn't remember these, but he asked her if she posted happy birthday, Ahmad, on the date that the defendants were arrested. When she was shown those, she agreed that she did. Uh, she also posted, now it's time for justice, referring to this case. And through that questioning, she also revealed that her Facebook profile name is actually different now than it was when she filled out the questionnaire. She says she does that often, really every two or three months. It's just something she likes to do. But that spawned a conversation about whether or not these potential jurors are even asked if the questions that they answered are still accurate while they are answering these questions. Because remember, they filled this out at least a month ago and turned it in to the court. So here's some of that argument from Kevin Goff. I'm making a motion orally under the 5th, 6th, and 14th Amendments of the United States Constitution, under the parallel provisions of the Georgia Constitution, and pursuant to Brady v. Maryland and its progeny, uh, because I think the examination of the last juror by counsel uh, made it abundantly clear that there is a tremendous disparity of resources here. 
the, the defendants are, are laboring under limited resources, uh, under the best of circumstances, particularly when it comes to the social media stuff, which is relatively new. I mean, I've never had a jury trial before where social media was such a significant, it's one thing in divorce court. That's all easy to follow. This is very different. Uh, and uh, I believe, I would assume that the state has amassed substantial dossiers uh, on all of the jurors. Uh, when I was a prosecutor, we certainly got the best that we could get. Uh, and obviously from the questions and responses of the jurors, the state has social media information, and we suspect a lot more information. There is such a disparity in this 21st century digital age, Your Honor, with all this online and social media, that it is impossible, even for the best defended defendants, to keep up with all of that. And if the state has exculpatory information from social media or other places with respect to, it's not exculpatory, it is with respect to the bias and prejudice or impartiality of jurors, if they have that information, if they know that a juror isn't being truthful on social media or has said things that would suggest that they are biased or partial against any of the defendants in a case, then my contention is constitutional. The state is required either to share that information with the defense or, in doubtful cases, that they would submit that social media to the court for an in-camera inspection, and if, in fact, the court finds social media or other material in possession of the state, that would be material to the defense in selecting a jury, then we're entitled to have it. To say that you have a right to a trial by jury, to say that you have a right to voir dire jurors, but withhold the information that the state is peculiarly, situ peculiarly situated to have, creates such a fundamental imbalance and unfairness that it would essentially deprive the defendants of a fair trial before it even begins. Now, if I had a case to cite, Your Honor, I'd be happy to do it. And I know this is a shock to Your Honor, but I don't. I guess someone else tonight will have another homework project. But I just think the, the vast disparity of resources between the state of Georgia, and I'm, I'm not picking on the Cobb County DA, but there's a lot of other people behind them, including the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. The state is the state. But given that vast disparity of resources, there's no way that lawyers sitting up at 3 o'clock in the morning looking on Facebook or Pinterest or Twitter or Instagram are ever going to be able to keep up with the resources that the state can and has amassed in this matter. So many creative arguments from Kevin Goff. So he's asking for the prosecution to turn over any social media information that they have about these potential jurors. He also wants to know that these potential jurors are going to be asked or told that their questionnaires are under oath. And with penalty of perjury, the judge said they can start asking these jurors if anything has changed. But he did not rule on whether or not there is a Brady violation. Okay. Was 199 bounced or is 199 still in play? 199 was actually qualified, so she will be returning to be part of that 64. Wow. Okay. Um, this jury, uh, are they going to be anonymous? Excellent question. It's a question that came up today, really, when a juror was concerned about their safety. And here's a look at juror number 181 and what she said. The prosecutor tried to assure her that she would be protected. And she said if selected, she would be concerned for her safety, would be concerned about her ability to listen to the case because she values her life and her property. And if her identity is protected during the trial, her concerns would be alleviated. And when the prosecutor tried to tell her that they would be doing what they can to protect her, she was asked to leave the courtroom momentarily. The judge did say that this is not officially an anonymous jury like we see in other cases. These jurors' names are still on the record, not where the media can see them, but the court staff knows them, the people involved, the parties, everyone knows their names. And it's not uh, something that they can control sometimes about people knowing who they might be. So the defense wanted to make sure she knew that this was not officially an anonymous jury and the court can't guarantee that no one will find out who she is, especially after a verdict in this case. All right, Julie, Janae, and Brunswick, let's get some reaction tonight from our think tank, Renee Hill, Carmen Rowe, Molly Palmer, still with us. All right, uh, Molly, uh, Juror 199, did, did she sound fair and impartial? You know, I think the, that's the a The Ahmaud Arbery birthday post and 
Right. Uh, they hunted him down like an animal? Yeah, see, here's the issue. What actually happens during this phase of jury selection is that jurors are asked, you know, their feelings and their sense of the case, but then there's this follow-up where the jurors are rehabilitated. And what happens then is that the judge or whoever is asking the question says, okay, but in light of all of that juror 199, do you still think you could set that aside, listen to the evidence and the testimony presented in this case and render a fair and impartial verdict based on that evidence and testimony? And it's real easy for people to say, you know what, yes, I can, despite my Facebook posts, which, you know, they didn't know about those at the time, but it's it's real easy to qualify people so long as they're rehabilitated. But is that genuine? Is that true? Is that real in the heart of juror 199? I am doubtful that it is, that she is fair and impartial. But all she has to say are those magic words. And guess what? She's part of the pool. All right, Carmen Roach, should, should the uh, prosecution be handing over all their research on social media about these jurors? You know, I love this lawyer. I love how creative he is. Without a case, with a case. I mean, I've never heard of such a thing. Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, jurors need to be qualified to serve. And if the state had information that they were not qualified to serve, I think that that would serve their interest to turn it over because it could result in a reversal on appeal. Other than that, I don't think they have to do the homework for defense counsel, but I love that he's being creative enough to see if they'll do it for him. But I can't imagine that's happening in real time. But again, I love the arguments. Renee Hill, how about the anonymity? This is becoming much more common in these high profile cases. Do you think this jury should remain anonymous and that would help them uh, have be able to be fair and impartial and render the verdict based just on the evidence and not worry about uh, anyone coming after him? I mean, it, I, if you start to get a lot of jurors indicating that they are fearful to sit on the case, you know, if they are not anonymous, then that's something that the court will certainly have to consider. And it might be helpful in the same way that you would consider whether or not the jury should, should be sequestered so that they can focus totally on the case and not be concerned about anything else happening on the outside. It's something that they can certainly take into consideration and it might be helpful for this jury. You know, there was a jury that was anonymous. That was the jury in the trial of Derek Chauvin, uh, the man who murdered George mm -hmm. Floyd. But uh, some of them are no longer anonymous. Uh, they were on with Don Lemon. Let's take a look. <laughs> <laughs> this was about, you know, um, the, obviously the death of a man. But I'm sure you knew the, the whole racial aspect of it. You're very diverse. And nobody was afraid to share their feelings on that? Not at all. That... Not, race wasn't even ever mentioned okay. in the three and a half weeks that we were in that courtroom. And it was never mentioned during deliberations, I don't no. believe. I mean, I think we got here because of systemic racism within the system, right? Because of what's been going on. That's how we got to a courtroom in the first place. But when it came down to all three verdicts, it was based on the evidence and the facts, 100%. Okay, that case, not about race. This case, Ahmaud Arbery, is it about race? What do you think, Renee? It's certainly about race. When you look at the fact that Ahmad was a black man running through a white neighborhood, you look at how he was treated by the defendants in this case, you look at the words that were spoken even after he was shot and laying dying on the ground, it's absolutely about race. All right, but um, uh, Carmen, do you think the lawyers will be talking about race to this jury? If they don't, then they're making a mistake. I mean, they need to talk about race. And other commentators have said it, but if I was running down the street in that neighborhood and I stopped by an abandoned location, I don't think I would be chased down and killed. And so it, race is very much an issue. And the demographics in that area, I think, tell us that it is an issue and it has to be discussed in that trial. Will both sides discuss it, Molly? Yeah, I think both sides will. Look, this is my this is my home state, man, and this is the deep south. And racism and all of its vestiges are alive and well in the deep south. And and, and both sides are going to talk about it for a number of reasons because don't forget the defense is going to rely on this civil war era citizen's arrest law, right? And, and, you know, that license plate that now we're fighting about, are we going to show the Confederate flag or not? That's actually the Georgia's former state flag. These are all issues that are going to come up and be discussed by both sides throughout this trial. 
All right. Think, think Tank staying with us.